in regards to speaking about about race. My question to you is, in your opinion, is this something that he that you believe he is conscious of, or is this something that you believe is he's subconscious of, and psychologically he has he's, he he don't have the ability to do it because he's subconscious to it. And then second, uh, whether it be here in 2012 or 2016, where do you see? Black America in politics post Barack Obama. The burden rests on the you know the masses of black people to understand what he's doing, whether he's winking or nodding or signifying. You know, there's a new book out on Obama uh, and his use of language. It's a very powerful book, very nuanced by two sociolinguists. I learned a lot by reading it, and they're making the argument about Obama's skillful use of language and his signification in different audiences, and doing so because he's so hamstrung and limited on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's trying to open up new avenues of possibility and new expressions that don't scare the hell out of the people that he's trying to talk to. He's so hyper-conscious of you know, not wanting to come off in a certain way. But again, you know, those limitations are in place for a reason. A swing voters looking at an angry black man, even if he's scoring points charismatically to oppose his, you know, debate partner may not play so well in Wisconsin or Ohio, right? Or certainly in Texas. So I think he's quite conscious of it. I think he depends upon the mass of the black people to understand it. Um, let me tell you, I was in a uh, Oval Office meeting, or really was in the Roosevelt Room with about off the record 10 of so called notable black people. And Obama has much sense to me. Like, he says, Look, I could go to XYZ community. He did a lot of heat from black people about why he wasn't represented. He said, I could go to XYZ community right now, and I would be supporting. He said, If I bring Michelle, my numbers are out the box. Now, he wasn't saying it like, so shut the hell up and get out of my face kind of thing, although, maybe. Uh, <laughs> what he was suggesting is that he was depending upon black people's sophisticated understanding of where he was, what he could and could not say, what he could and could not do, and that they forgave him in advance. They forgave him in advance for the offenses he would commit in the name of a black progress that his presence in the office not only offered, not only pointed to, but represented for their kids. Kids who grew up now who, who, who never will know anything but starting off like a black person. Right. And not just what that means symbolically, though that's important, but what those symbolic politics mean in terms of the transformation of possibility materially for those kids, right? So, so no, I don't think he's unconscious at all. I think he's quite conscious of it. You can hold him accountable based upon how he's manipulated or exploited that interest among African American people and others, but you can't say that he doesn't know. In terms of black America, uh, 2012, 2016, you know, we're post Obama, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's a growing up process. You know, a lot of people get mad when, when black people take a certain kind of pride in Obama. Like, you know, I, some of my white friends say, hey, hey, uh, he's half us, you know. <laughs> right? uh, I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got half a dude. Can we, can we celebrate this half a dude for a minute? Right? And I said, yes, the brothers in prison, too, they have white, but you done gave them up for black. Go with them, too. Go with them. But at the same time, you know, when you got the first one, of course there's pride, like my mama calling me. Are we crazy? Of course we get that. Right, we see him walking down Air Force One. Like, geez, that's just cool. <laughs> he pointed at me. You know? And he's got a kind of swagger that he can't necessarily show in public. I remember when he was uh, running, my wife was supporting Hillary and I was supporting him, of course. My wife had been introduced to him on a panel, the three of us, me, him, and an actress named Cheryl Ralph in 1992 after he came out of Harvard. I've known that one. So he says, uh, Mike, come over here. He said, take this picture, send it to your wife and show what a real one of those like. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that guy. I do that. I would love to see more of that guy. But he knows he can't really do that. You talk to him and say, you know, I'm just trying to represent. 
I mean, really, uh, at this rate, I mean, so. Now, he's manipulating the making, is he exploiting sorta, of, but with useful moral consequence, and with a kind of ethical intent that cannot be obscured for the masses of black people who get it. And in the West, they just get it. So after him, um, you know, the possibilities have been widened. You know, uh, I think Obama has a permanent place. The, the struggle for the greatest black man of all time. Right? Martin Luther King Jr. was enshrined, just unchallenged. Obama comes along. Now Obama, I don't think can edge King out. I don't want to make it a competition of a kind of patriarchal sense, but it is about patriarchs and family powers and approach, you know, these, these big figures. Obama's occupying a huge space. Even when he says I'm not a black leader, even when he says I'm not here to lead black America, um, there's so much possibility opened up. So I think that his impact will, you know, we'll have to determine it for the next 20, 25 years, 30 years to see just what he opened up, just how he changed the face of the game. If court, I suspect that Obama has opened up huge space for the reorganization of black politics, but not the loss of the necessity for representing those interests in some fashion. Well, it's complicated. I mean, it, it, it reinforces some of that stuff. Uh, it articulates it. It makes it visible. It makes it powerful uh, to be dealt with. And sometimes the very expression of it is the relief of some of it. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, some people think, oh my God, you say it. But sometimes if you're talking about it, you ain't doing it. Yeah. And if you're talking about it, you're trying to work through it. And if you're talking about it, you're at least trying to give rise uh, an expression of some of those ideas that are unavoidably seen as destructive and somebody at least is alerted and somebody can intervene. I mean, but, but Rose, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> come on, man. I mean, but 16 ain't enough. <laughs> summer 88. Or was it 89? Or was it summer? Oh, so never mind. mind. I mean, come on, man. That, that Andre 3000 right. verse or. 16 and look the music that Rick Ross nobody saw Rick Ross coming mm. right mm. Justice League has put him on a whole different level so my point is it's all art is is Madonna a whore or is she a virgin I mean mm -hmm. or is she worshiping you know she's been able to move in and out of persona in a way that we punish rappers for okay he's a CEO he's talking about moving keys it's all a story is Al Pacino gonna be beat up because he's Scarface so <laughs> but, but hip-hop depends upon the fusion right uh, and the the, the the breaking down of the barrier between the represented and the real mm -hmm. but that's a tribute to their representational and artistic genius, not an indictment of the fact that people have to tell stories in order to right. exist as artists in a certain sphere. So I'm not as, you know, I guess distressed by the fact that, you know, Rick Ross was a CEO. I'm glad you were a CEO and you I'm made up those stories. Too. I'm glad you made up right. those stories that you weren't really doing that, that you weren't the real Rick. Freeway Rick Ross, who's mad at you and stuff, and then you, you and who is it? Uh, you and uh, Young Jeezy having mm -hmm. beef and shooting up the scene because you, you know, Big Meech right. and all them knows me, not you, dude. Right. Are you serious? That's not the point. The point is how do you transmute that into art right. that at least has the the, the the power to help people survive? You know, so, like, so, so can hip hop have an effect on politics? Oh, well, okay. the politics of yeah. you know self recognition. And ultimately, I mean, if Tupac is alive, that's a different kind of political organization. I think, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. That will be, you know, yeah. just the other day I got lynched by some crooked cops, and to this day, them same cops on the beat getting major pay. But when I get my check, they taking tax out. We paying the cops to knock the blacks out. I mean, that's, you know, there's something in, there's something in, you know, Lauren Hill and Jay and Absolutely. Nas, especially. Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation with Nas before I came over to this election night. You know, life is good. I mean, think about what's being said there, what's being talked about, you know? Uh, so it's different ways of expressing politics. It's not like we're gonna organize and do this, but if you raise people's awareness and force them to deal with certain issues, I mean, the point that our dear professor here was making about 20 times over, uh, the reduction of the death of black men, if you have an artistic, you know, expression, some that reinforces that pathology, some that exposes that pathology, and others that expose it for the point of dismantling it, then you're talking about the artistic 
accompaniment right. to a revive a changed psyche that has the potential to lead right. to the belief that we should challenge. You know? <laughs>